Uh, welcome to the Aging Boomers. I'm your host, Frank Sampson, and of course, as many of you know, on our show, we discuss so many of the issues facing not only boomers, but their parents, and what we know, of course, is an aging population. And I just want to thank everybody for all their support. Our, uh, our long list of listeners is growing, and I want to thank you all for that, because I know uh, it's growing because you're sharing our information with friends and family and acquaintances, and I want to thank you for that. Um, so many of you have gone on uh, iTunes or iHeartRadio to subscribe and listen, which is free. You could also download our free app. Uh, just go, if you have an iPhone or Android phone, just type in the Aging Boomers, and you could download the app and keep up to date on uh, all of our professionals that we, that we interview on the show. Um, I want to remind everybody that today's show is sponsored by Senior Care Authority, a professional senior placement and elder care management organization that has a national network of advisors to help in determining the right path for senior living and receiving proper care. So whether it's in-home care, assisted living, or memory care, get the necessary advice from a senior care advisor in your area by calling Senior Care Authority at 888-809-1231. Or you could go directly to the website at www.seniorcareauthority.com. And also, you know, just want to thank everybody for all their support. We got some uh, great accolades on uh, on the new book that I came out with, which uh, was also called The Aging Boomers. Um, and you can get it on Amazon. There's The Kindle version has been out for a little bit, but the uh, now you can get it on paperback as well. So again, thank you for your support. Check it out. Um, some great information in it. Speaking about uh, books, we have with us uh, uh, we have with us as our guest today, Dr. Michael Weisberg, and uh, Dr. Weisberg uh, has been a practicing gastroenterologist for over well, actually over you've been in for thirty one years. You've been in uh, in your career. And he's in uh, Plano, Texas. He is a board certified in internal medicine and gastroenterology. Dr. Weisberg also serves as a board member of Digestive Health Associates of Texas. He's written stories throughout his medical career. And in 2011, he won first prize in a short story competition sponsored by Presbyterian Hospital of Dallas. And we're going to talk about his newly released novel, The Hospitalist, which he'll talk about and tell you how you can get. So, uh, Dr. Weisberg, which I'm, if it's okay, I'm going to call you Michael. Uh, we're on first name basis already. And uh, thanks so much for joining us on The Aging Boomers. Frank, thanks so much for having me. I really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, it's great. So, you know, I always like to ask people you know, especially careers that they go into. And I don't know if if anybody's ever even asked you this, but I mean, you've had a career of 31 years being a doctor. Um, why why did you choose that career? It's a wonderful career, but why did you choose that career years ago? I've wanted to be a doctor since I was five years old. And I've always told people that that's what I was going into. Of course, when I grew up, the hierarchy, it seemed, in life was God, pay your parents, and then the doctor. And I had an amazing doctor when I was growing up in Huntington, West Virginia, named Dr. Robert Kopp. I was a very sickly child and um, spent a lot of my time either in bed or in the hospital. Hmm. Dr. Kopp was paralyzed on one side of his body from having sepsis at the age of 12. And still, when I was too sick to leave the second floor of our house, he would call, uh, walk up the stairs, pulling himself up with his one good leg and his one good arm in order to see me. He was the most kind, gentle person I'd ever met. And the most important thing to him I could see was to help the patient, to help the child and get them better. And I decided in an early age that what I wanted my life goal to be was to try to help people, try to heal people and get them better. I also had experience at the Boston Children's Hospital when I was six years old. Um, I, they couldn't figure out what was going on with me while I was still sick. 
And at that time, I flew for the first time in an airplane with my mother to Boston Children's Hospital, which was supposed to be the finest children's hospital in the world. And I spent two weeks there. And while I was there, the doctors and nurses were incredible. They would do everything they could to help you. They were doing everything they could to try to find out what was wrong with you and get you better. But also, they made an atmosphere in which you wanted to get better. You wanted to feel well. You wanted to be part of the world. While I was there, I met Miss America. She was doing a television show from the grounds, the gardens of Boston Children's Hospital. One night, I was in my room with my roommate watching TV. We, got a knock. we were watching The Lone Ranger on TV. We got a knock on the door. I opened the door, and there was The Lone Ranger from television standing there. He came into our room and talked to us, signed autographed pictures for us. So I knew from a very early age that what I wanted to do with my life was to try to help people, make people better, and I had a role model in Dr. Kopp. No one in my family had ever been a doctor before, but I had very supportive parents. My mom always said I should be a doctor because she felt like that was something that I would excel at, that I always wanted to be someone that could help people, and it gave me great satisfaction. And my dad led by example. My father worked hard to send three children to college and two children to medical school. And he always said, his philosophy was, always aim high, aim for the stars. Because even if you don't quite make it as high as you want to, at least you'll have achieved something. And to my parents and to myself, the highest thing to, be, to achieve was to become a doctor. Well, I think that is a great story. Great story. So, I mean, you've experienced so much over those more than three decades uh, in being a doctor. What are some of the big changes that you've seen in medicine, let's say, over the past, I don't know, couple decades, let's say? Uh, and any, any top things that come to mind? The greatest change in medicine, in modern medicine, in the last 20 years is that your doctor no longer takes care of you when you're sick. Whether it's your pediatrician, your family doctor, your internist, they no longer take care of you when you're sick and need to be hospitalized. Instead, they turn your care over to a doctor who knows nothing about you, has never seen you before, and usually has no records on you, and that doctor is called the hospitalist. This trend started in the late 90s, and just a few doctors did it, but now they, everybody does it. So that it makes it difficult as a specialist, as myself being a gastroenterologist, as far as the practice of medicine in the hospital, because you're dealing with the person who's making the major decisions for the patient who's never known them, never seen them before. And I think that the patients feel somewhat cheated also in that they don't have that doctor that they've gone to yearly for physical exams, who's given them their immunizations, etc., there with them when they need them the most. And so I think it's changed the whole dynamic of medicine. It's brought about this whole new class of doctor called the hospitalist, which is what the title of my book and which my book is about. And these are the doctors that we're now depending on to get you through the roughest times, the sickest times in your life. So that's interesting. So you're saying it's been around, hospitalist has been around since the late 1990s, but... Um, right. Uh, would you say that uh, if, if, if somebody goes out and uh, asks their uh, 10 neighbors of theirs, do they know what a hospitalist is? Do you think many would know? Well, that's the interesting thing is that uh, I, when I give talks on how the art of medicine has changed to a business in the 21st century, people in the audience say the, they have no idea what a hospital is or what they do, or the ones that they do, a lot of them would stand up and say, well, I was in the hospital recently with such and such a problem, and there was a doctor who came in and out and took care of me, but they never really told me who they were. They never left me a card. And now I understand from reading your book or from listening to your talk that that was the hospitalist. So I think that the great majority of America really isn't even aware of this dramatic change in how healthcare works. So, so somebody who, for example, is your internist, all right? Yes. And, and you have to go into the hospital for something, whatever, whatever it is. Are you saying that the internist really isn't involved anymore, even if they do work out of that hospital? Uh, how, how does that work? The internist is affiliated with the hospital. I see them at the quarterly staff meetings. I see them when they have party for doc parties for Doctor's Day. But they don't step foot into the hospital anymore. And I don't even think that on the majority of cases, at least the ones that I'm involved with, that the internists and the hospitalists interact. 
that they know each other, that they would feel comfortable calling up and say, okay, this is uh, Dr. So-and-so. I'm admitting Mrs. Smith to the hospital now. This is what's been going on with her for the last 25 years. This is the reason I'm admitting her. And uh, if you have any questions or anything that happens while she's in the hospital, please feel free to contact me because I definitely want to make sure that everything goes well for her. I think there's a tremendous division. I think it's when you're uh, outpatient, doing well, or have minor sicknesses, the flu, things like that that can be treated as an outpatient, these internists, family doctors are happy to see you or have their nurse practitioner or physician assistant see you. You know, now in medicine, doctors, these doctors that used to see, say, 12 to 15 patients a day, the internists, now see 50 to 60 patients a day in their office with the help of what are called physician expenders. And that when you're admitted to the hospital, the emergency room doctor takes a quick history, and then they immediately call the hospitalist, and your care is immediately taken over completely by that doctor. The internist has no involvement. I've never heard of a hospitalist calling the internist during the patient's stay, or even when they're about to be discharged. A lot of times the hospitalist will write on the discharge summary, this patient needs to see Dr. Michael Weisberg in one week. And I'll find out about that a week later because it's written on a summary that's sent to my office. The phone call hasn't been made, and I may not be out of time. I may be out of town at that time. I may not be able to see the patient at that time. So there's not the communication that there should be. There's not the interaction that there should be. The internist should have the knowledge of who your hospitalist is, what kind of a doctor they are, and also if you have special issues or special needs or have special wants that you have, that those are communicated, and they're not. So and I want to get on to your book in a minute, but I find this fascinating. So you you have a specialty, obviously, in internal mes- medicine and gastroenterology. So are you kind of orchestrating it? Uh, in other words, if, if somebody who's in the hospital, you're their hospitalist, your hospitalist, um, are you kind of taking care of everything, or may you bring in specialists in various areas, and you're kind of orchestrating that for the patient? Well, that's an excellent question. I haven't practiced internal medicine in 28 years. So in order to be a gastroenterologist, you first have to be a internal, Google an internal medicine residency, which I did, three years. And then I did three years of fellowship training in gastroenterology. So I'm not really an internist. I'm a gastroenterologist. I'm a specialist. But the way it turns out is that a lot of times I am the one orchestrating what happens in the hospital. I'm the one that's getting the old record from the patient. I'm the one that's calling the doctors that have seen the patient before and saying, okay, this guy, this patient has a heart attack, has had a heart attack in the past, this patient has a st- stroke in the past. These are the limiting issues. And I'm the one calling the specialist, just taking it on myself to say, hey, wait a minute, we need to get someone. Before I scope this patient, a lot of times I'm called in to do an endoscopy or colonoscopy. They need to be evaluated for the heart by a cardiologist. I'll call the cardiologist. They need to be evaluated by the lung specialist because they're not breathing well. They need to be transferred to the intensive care unit because they're a lot sicker than you originally thought they were because they're in, say, diabetic ketoacidosis. So what you're saying has now come true. Rather than having the interns orchestrating things, a lot of time it is the specialist who gets involved and does that. A lot of the hospitalists, first of all, see... A lot, maybe have 25 to 30 patients that they're in charge of in the hospital, a large number of patients. The hours that they work and the shifts that they work are different. You may have a different hospital in the morning, in the evening, and then in the next day. So for that continuity of care, a lot of times it is someone like myself, a specialist, who is in charge of doing the consultation, who is in charge of trying to find the doctors to help that patient out. So I, I was going to save this question for the end. But I'm going to ask it now because I, I, I'd like to understand how it all ties together. So you've written a book called The Hospitalist. It's a novel, right? So it's, right. I, I guess, fiction, fiction. I guess, sort of. Huh? So uh, uh, I'm sure it's based on some experience. But how, how does so tell us how your book ties in the things that we've been talking about. I mean, we, we haven't touched about on you know, advocacy and kind of what happens after discharge and uh, from a hospital. But tell us a little bit more about the book, and then we'll we'll continue the conversation on the other subjects. Frank, the book was written because I would come home at night, just 
thoroughly disgusted and annoyed and upset about what was going on in medicine. And I'd complain to my wife. She was really the only one, my wife, Cheryl, that was there to listen and hear what I had to say. The other doctors didn't seem to even talk about it. They seemed to just accept it. The patients seemed to accept it. This is the way it's going to be. And finally, I decided that the best way to get my feelings out, and almost as a therapy for me, was to write a book. I've, as you said in my introduction, been a writer. I was an English literature major at Vanderbilt University, and I've been a writer my whole life, and I love it. And it became a work, a labor of love. It took me 10 years to write the book. It's based on a lot of things that have happened. There is, it's a lot of fiction. It is a fiction book. But some of the characters are based on people that I know and that I've worked with. And it's based on experiences that ha have happened to me. Now, he's talked about advocacy. When people are in the hospital and no longer have their usual doctor taking care of them and knowing them, they're sick, they're getting drugs for pain, and they're out of it. They don't know what's happening to them a lot of the time. I once had a patient who was 49 who I'd taken care of for years, a woman, who was admitted to the hospital to start dialysis. She had, her kidneys were failing. And when I went to see her just as a social call, I saw on her door it was written DNR. There was a sign there which means do not resuscitate. Right. And I went in and talked to her, and I said, wait a minute, you're 49 years old. She said, well, I talked to the hospitalist, met him for the first time, and he told me how awful dialysis was. I don't think it's something I want to go through. So I've made the decision that if anything happens to me, I don't want to be resuscitated or brought back to life. Hmm. I said, wait a minute. I said, you're someone I've known for years. You have a loving husband and family. And although dialysis isn't the greatest, you'd be a great candidate to get a kidney transplant. And we talked off for 20 minutes. She cried. But finally she said, you know what? I do want to live. I don't want to be DNR. So we took the DNR sign off of her door. And fast forward 10 years, this lady got a kidney transplant a year later. Now, 10 years later, is a grandmother with three grandchildren and loving life. So the hospitalist who had met her once for the first time made her DNR. There was no one there like a husband or family member to watch her and say, hey, wait, that's not the way I want my wife to do it. No, her life is still, there's a lot for her to live for. So you do need to have someone in the hospital with you, if at all possible. It can be a husband, a wife, a child, a best friend, but someone who knows that what your interests are, what your life is like, and what you need. Because you're not going to have that doctor there, that person that knows you to do that. And things are going to happen quickly. You're going to get medications, have procedures, this and that. So having an advocate, having a person there with you is extremely important. And it, how have things changed? I think they're changing now. Uh, you know, as you know, I'm in the industry as well. Um, and, and I see things changing mainly because of, uh, you know, dollars always play a role. So uh, things going on with the Affordable Care Act and penalties uh, to hospitals on readmissions that take place within 30 days and things moving to bundled payments, which we don't have to get into all that. But there's changes that are going on, you know, in the industry um, where maybe a hospital in the past, when they discharge somebody, it was like, all right, they're gone next, and if they come back, they come back. Things are changing. Am I right? Sure. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I think things are changing, and I think in a lot of cases, things are changing for the worse. We have a thing where we call it the kind of the revolving door policy. It's so important when a patient is discharged that two things are done. Number one, that they're given medicines that they understand how to take and that they can afford. I can't tell you the number of times we've had patients that are given prescriptions, go to the pharmacy, can't afford the medicine, say it's an antibiotic that would keep them well, and have to come right back to the hospital after a few days because they're no longer on the medicine that would cure their infection. And then number two, I think that after discharge, it's a very important that there should, patients should see the proper doctors at the proper times and follow up. And I think a phone call would take care of that. A hospital is calling a doctor and saying, we're discharging this patient now, and we expect you to see the patient, or we'd like you to see the patient in a week. They need to have their blood count checked. They need to have their potassium checked. Whatever needs to be done so that it's actually written down as to what has to happen for the patient. 
I think it's harder working in the hospital now than it's ever been before. Uh, in my book, The Hospitalist, I purposely set the book, structured the book, so that it begins and ends the main part of the book with letters of denial of payment from insurance companies to the doctors in the hospital. Why did I do that? Because I feel that the insurance companies are the major drivers behind the major changes in medicine that we're seeing now in 2016. How have they done that? First of all, by ratcheting down doctors' payments, what they pay doctors. What I'm getting paid now for taking care of patients is about 35% of what I got paid 25 years ago across the board. There aren't too many other fields that you can say that about. But they've driven doctors so that they've made it less profitable to go to the hospital and take a lot of time to take care of patients who are sick and more profitable, as I said earlier, to see a lot of patients almost to operate a factory in your office. They've made it so that doctors like an internist will now do Botox injections after taking a weekly course for cosmetic reasons because they can do those for cash. Or doctors will do stress tests in tourists and family practitioners in their office because they get paid not only for interpreting the, uh, the stress test but also a facility fee rather than referring those patients to a cardiologist who are better trained and better suited to doing those type of things. So I think the insurance companies do other things as well. They have what are called formularies. They tell you what drugs they'll pay for for your patients. So, Frank, you could have been doing well on a certain medication for 30 years, and I've been taking care of you, and we're doing well, and then all of a sudden we get a letter from the insurance company saying, we're not paying for that drug anymore. He's going to have to pay $500 or $800 a month now, which most people can't afford. And so I think that the insurance companies are trying to practice medicine by issuing these formularies, and also by starting, they have a practice called peer-to-peer -peer review. When I want to order a CAT scan or an MRI scan on you, Frank, because I feel that it's necessary after taking care of you and I'm your doctor, a lot of times I have to call the insurance company and talk to a doctor. Well, it would be nice if I could just call the insurance company directly, be immediately connected to a doctor and talk to them and explain why it needed to be done, but that's not how it happens. It's a, usually a process that takes about 30 minutes as I'm passed from an operator to a secretary to a nurse and then finally to a doctor who I finally have to plead my case as to why Frank Sampson needs to get an MRI scan done so that I can help him to get him better. So I think the major driving force behind these changes are the insurance companies, and I think that's where a lot of the focus needs to be to try to get things better. So, I mean, what will people, you know, hopefully you get a lot of people that get your book and read it. What, what do you hope they'll gain and how it can help things uh, from reading your book? Well, first of all, I hope that they'll enjoy reading it because I really wrote it as a dark satire. I think it's a satire, but I think it's funny. I think it's humorous, and a lot of people have said it's humorous. As a matter of fact, I was looking on Amazon.com, and they listed where they list books and stuff as far as you know, bestsellers and things, and under medical doctor's books, under humor and satire, my book was rated, I think, number 44. So I think that I, I would hope that they would enjoy it. One person who read the book who did a um, magazine critique on it said that it reminded them of a book called The Ugly American. The Ugly American was a book published in the uh, late, I'm sorry, in the early 1960s about American foreign policy and how it had gone wrong and all the bad things we'd done and why all these com countries were turning to communist, communism. When the book was originally written, it was written truthfully, and it was just kind of dull and boring. Well, they changed it to a fiction and a satire, and by doing it, they really pointed out the foibles in the system and how Americans had gone wrong. It's the same thing with the hospitalists. I hope that by reading my book, even though it's a fiction, even though it goes way beyond the way things may ha actually happen, it'll open people's eyes to how the healthcare system has changed. What can they personally do about it? I think what they can do is say to their doctor, their internist or family doctor, I want you to be involved when I'm sick. If you're not going to go to the hospital, I at least want you to know the hospital is going to take care of me, at least on a first-name basis, so that you can call them or that I can call you from the hospital and tell you, hey, this isn't going right. I need you to help me and step in. And if the doctor can't do that, I think they need to find a doctor who still does go to the hospital, who's an internist or family doctor. There aren't a lot of them. They're very few and far between. But the ones who do that, they call themselves the old-fashioned doctors, are great. And they'll take care of you both outside the hospital and in the hospital and make sure that the transition is smooth.
I mentioned the, the uh, needing an advocate earlier. I think that's an important thing for patients also, having someone with you, being prepared to uh, be in an atmosphere where the only person who really is, knows you and is on your side from the very start is that advocate. And I think that that's something else that the book shows. The book goes into a lot of other things as well. The book shows the importance of having a role model in life. You see doctors whose role models and how they became doctors because of the role models. You see a doctor who had two sons, one who he was able to spend time with and become a role model who's become successful, and another who he didn't spend time with, he just fathered, and who became a criminal and a murderer. You see one of the characters in the book, Jumpy Johnson, who is the uh, paranoid schizophrenic patient who's admitted with, to a hospitalist not knowing him before, who has a role model of a father who you can see how Jumpy developed a lot of his traits and characteristics from that. I talk about the AIDS epidemic in my book and what it was like being a young doctor in the 1980s when AIDS was there. And I go through this um, part where Aaron Bernstein, who's the main character, one of the main characters, and who's the gastroenterologist, remembers, thinks back about being a doctor in the 1980s and how no one knew what AIDS was, where it came from, how it was transmitted. And here we were with these young men coming into the hospital in droves and just dying. And knowing that if we got you know, infected or touched a needle with their blood and it touched us, it could be our, lead to our demise also. That part of the AIDS epidemic, the doctors who are heroic and on the front lines like myself who are taking care of those patients, I don't think has ever really been brought forth either in a book or in some fashion to say that, yeah, there was tremendous amount of danger to those doctors, but we stood in there. We, t we were in places like Ben Taub Hospital in Houston where I was or Jefferson Davis Hospital in Houston where I was or Parkland Hospital here in Dallas where one of the scenes takes place. We stood in there and took care of those patients and did what doctors are supposed to do, look to heal the patient. The main objective of being a doctor is to take the patient, a sick patient, and make them well. The main objective of a doctor is not to be in the business, profit, and loss. Yeah. Well, I, I'm certainly excited to read your book. I'm sorry I haven't read it yet, but I'm going to. I hope everybody else is. So how, how would they go about uh, getting your book? How would they go about doing that? My book is available on Amazon, uh, lulu.com, iBookstore, and The Nook. I have a website that has um, other things that I've written on it, short stories, poems, and things like that, as well as the events, the different uh, book signings I've done, the book discussions that I've done, the talks that I've done. It's www.michaelfweisberg, that's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-F as in Franklin, Weisberg, W-E-I-S-B-E-R-G, dot com. Great. Great. And I know for those that are, I know you're based in the Dallas area and we have listeners all over the country, but for those that are in the Dallas area, you're going to be speaking this fall. Am I correct? Why don't you share, uh, share a little information yes, about that? I am. I'm going to be speaking. I won the competition for TED Talks with SMU. It started off with the one minute talk, just, um, one minute going over how the art of medicine became a business in the 21st century. And then they had eight finalists, and we spoke at a place called the Granada Theater here in Dallas in front of a crowd of about 250 people. And I won that competition. So now I'll be speaking on November 12th at SMU at McFarland Auditorium with two other people who won other areas of competition for TED Talks. So three of us total, and then I understand they're bringing in two famous speakers um, to speak, five speakers total, and um, that will be on November 12th at SMU, and it's a 15 to 18 minute talk that I'll be giving then. That's great. Congratulations on that. That's one. That's, Thank you so uh, much, Frank. I appreciate that's wonderful. that. Wonderful. And um, anyway, I want to. Uh, Dr. Weisberg, Michael, I want to, you know, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to join us. I, I really appreciate it. Frank, it was my pleasure, and I just want to congratulate you on your book that's come oh, out. Thank you. And I'm looking thank forward you. to reading your book also. Great. We'll, uh, we'll share copies with one another. I'll get it out to you. So that good. sounds great. Good. So, uh, and again, I want to thank everybody for joining us on The Aging Boomers. Thanks for all your support. Just be safe out there, and we'll talk to you all soon.